what's going on, it has been loosely um, that there was this seemingly very promising moment um, around the beginning of Occupy where, this is one of the reasons I really wish Jake Spezio was here, um, where Occupy kind of ha happened randomly, right? It was this sort of event that, um, the way I was talking about it in Buffalo was, uh, I friends who were there for the like shutdown of Wall Street march that I just assumed everyone was gonna get arrested at, right? Talked to them the night before. I was like, all right, you guys know my phone number, call me when you're in jail, I'll bail you out, right? They go down, have the little action thing, end up in a park. I get a phone call that night. And like, I'm sitting around in Pittsburgh with all these people, just like not even really paying attention to this thing at all, right? It's like the, how many dozen times someone had tried to shut down Wall Street, right? Uh, since the financial crisis started. I mean, this is like a relatively common event at this point. Um, get a phone call, hey, we're in this park, I think we're gonna stay the night. And my response was, you guys better get out of there. I'm like, why? I'm like, they're gonna kick the shit out of you guys. Like, they're going to run you out of this park. They're going to arrest everybody. Um, you should probably leave that area, like, right now. And the response was, yeah, I think we're still gonna stay here. I'm like, okay, call me when you go to jail. Get a call the next day. Hey, we're still here. And I was like, flabbergasted. I mean, there was nothing in the experience that any of us have ever had trying to do direct action in New York City that would have told us that that would have been what would have happened, right? Um, usually what would have happened is you would have been surrounded by orange netting and then probably pepper sprayed in the face and then arrested, right? And that was like common protocol in New York. Um, and then people started showing up and then more people started showing up and then money started flowing in and then other other parks started getting occupied and like we hit October 16th and it's like all these people are in the streets in Pittsburgh there are 5,000 people there right um, a lot of them are people that didn't usually hit the streets right you had your core of like maybe 200 anarchists which in Pittsburgh was like you know doable and not even necessarily almost everybody um, and all these people were there and it stepped off in Pittsburgh to like class war chance and we were like whoa Something might actually be going on here. Like something might actually be happening. Like this might be um, a point of intervention, a, a thing that could take off. And then by October 17th, almost everything went totally inert. People started camping down in their parks, right? Most of the purpose of the camps started becoming to maintain the camps, right? You started pouring all the resources into legal fights, over camps, um, and the camp became this sort of energy suck, right? This kind of thing that existed for the purpose of existing for these very conceptual reasons. It ended up being the strategic travesty. Um, when I went to Boston a little more than a year ago to do a workshop on terrain analysis, I was sitting around with people the night before and um, talking to them about their camp and they were telling me like, oh, well, here's where we were and we like, called up a satellite map of it, right? We were looking at, at, the, at the camp, right? Like the park they were in. And I'm like, okay, well, what was the surveillance like? And they were like, well, there were 42 cameras built up around the camp by the end of camp. And I'm like, how many were there when, they, when you started? They were like six. So in the three months they were there, the city of Boston had built 36 cameras around them, right? They existed in this contained bubble, right? You take that and you combine that with the fact that there was this fetishizing of transparency people broadcasting their meetings on live stream. And it made the entire attempt to actually infiltrate camps somewhat obsolete, right? Camps became these sort of inert, containable, easily surveilled spaces. Um, and if we look at what happened with most camps, they just burned themselves out. Right? This happened in Pittsburgh, we were talking about this about an hour ago. Um, this happened in a lot of cities. They essentially just burned themselves out into their own weight, right? But there's a series of reasons as to why this happened um, that I want to discuss and sort of discuss how the way that we've been attempting to work through this and other sort of impasses that we've hit uh, in the last decade um, have come to replicate the very dynamics that led, that led to that kind of an approach, right? That sort of approach to um, attempting to intervene in the situation. Um, so the first thing, and I've already been talking about this somewhat, is there's this assumption within social movements, and we find this around like Hakeem Bey, right? This idea of like temporary autonomous zones. We find this in Occupy, this obsession with 
holding space, right? This concept of visibility that means that we have to be in a spot for a reason in a way that's generally very easily containable. Um, anyone that was around the anarchist scene in the mid 2000s remembers black block marches where like 600 people would be marching down the street together <laughs> in one big group. And in DC, you could look down the side streets and see the lines of police cars just like containing you in, right? Front, back, down the side streets, helicopters overhead, um, that there was nowhere to go. We became this uh, force that attempted to engage on a terrain that wasn't conducive, right? Um, that there's this obsession, not just with holding space, but with holding space in uh, what I would consider to be like strategically suicidal situations, right? Uh, situations where we exist at such a dramatic disadvantage on the level of force um, that the only purpose becomes completely rhetorical, totally conceptual. Uh, we see this every single time um, you look at videos from demonstrations and some, like, a bunch of people come up to the front of a, of a line of riot police and, like, sit down and hold their fingers up or start chanting shame at them or something like that. And they'll stand there and wait until the cops start pepper spraying people to start moving, right? Um, we find this kind of problem in strategies around the 2008 RNC where this idea of sectors was developed in a complete strategic vacuum, right? None of us had any idea of what was gonna happen. None of us had any concept of what the security situation was going to be, right? The strategy gets developed, actually that was the second strategy, I don't know if people remember this, but the first one was um, adopting intersections. Remember that? Which was something that actually came out of International Monetary Fund demonstrations. So this was this idea of adopting intersections, right? Um, and so the idea became that like, if we could stay in an area and hold an area, um, then we could stop like delegate transportation or something like that. But anyone that was there um, that didn't end up in jail like relatively quickly um, knows that that strategy failed almost immediately, right? In the actual face of actual resistance, that strategy collapsed almost entirely, right away, right? The only sector that really hold, held out for any period of time was five. And that was the sector with, with the most militant resistance, right? And even sector five collapsed after about an hour and a half, right? But what did everybody do? They like flooded into the middle of the city. They started moving around. They started doing the logical thing, which is you see a line of police that are about to tear gas you, you go anywhere else than right there, right? Um, and it was the mobility of what was going on, the unpredictability of that, the contingency of that, that prevented people from getting cornered off and, and contained. And when people did get cornered off and contained, it happened in things like bridges, right? People would march onto bridges and get cut off and arrested in mass, like 300 people, right? Or it was like half the IWW got arrested at some like road behind the convention center. They decided to march down because it was like, the closest road to the convention center. It was a totally passion-driven decision, right? And they get down there, and they get cornered off, and they get arrested, right? Large, large numbers of people, about 200 people. And most of the arrests that happened at the RNC happened at points where mobility was grounded, where things were decelerated, where people were demobilized and kept in a spot, one single spot. In Occupy, we did that to ourselves, right? We created a situation in which movement became something that was entirely predictable and all deployed from single areas that were already contained, right? Which this idea was based on a series of mythologies about Tahrir Square, right? And the early discussions about Occupy were all about this idea of the Egyptian model, the Egyptian model, right? But the things that were very, very different between what happened in Egypt and what happened in most Occupy camps were very profound, right? Specifically, if, you, if anyone's ever looked at a satellite map of Cairo, Right, Tahrir Square is like the central traffic hub for the entire city, right? But the occupation of Tahrir Square itself cut off one end of the city from the other end of the city, right? It was the central economic hub for all of Cairo, right? And so the occupation of that would be akin to people in Chicago occupying like Lakeshore Boulevard, right? Um, or people in New York occupying Fifth Avenue for weeks and weeks and weeks on end. The second biggest difference is that Tahrir Square wasn't the area of primary importance. If we remember what happened, uh, the marches left from mosques. They left from neighborhoods. They converged to that point, but that point became sort of a logistics hub and kind of point of deployment, right? It in itself was never the goal. 
So researching the Twitter feeds, and I, I got really, really obsessed with the Egyptian uprising. Um, and I was reading Twitter feeds constantly. Um, one of the things that, that you noticed if you're reading the Twitter feeds, and this happened also in Libya and Syria as well, um, is that the Twitter feeds would start off really, really hopeful. It's kind of conceptual goals where they were engaging with a conceptual enemy in a conceptual terrain, right? We are the people fighting the regime for democracy, right? These like very nebulous ideas. And then someone would get shot. And the first time someone would get shot, all of a sudden it'd be like, interior ministry police are deploying from over here. The police station is this way. We have to hold this street. We need people at this barricade, right? Everything became very immediate and very material. Um, that what happens in not just Occupy, but American social movements in general, is this process of creating a situation in which we exist as this kind of conceptually unitary element, right? The movement, Occupy, so on, so on, so on. There's all these debates about what should Occupy do next, or for those of us that were around in the anti-war movement, right? What should the anti-war movement be doing now that the war started, right? This was like the big thing. Or for those of us that were around just after that, what should anarchists do after Miami, right? This like moment in which we thought we were very strong and we get down to Miami and just get crushed completely, just unmercilessly crushed. Um, and it destroyed people. I mean, Miami destroyed people. And we got back and there was infighting and there was a lot of discussion about what should we do next, right? Um, that these questions tend to group around a question and uh, it's funny because we were talking about Aragorn earlier, this is the biggest point of contention that the two of us will always argue about is that he just, he went on a book tour and he was, he was giving this talk about the question of what is to be done, right? And what I'm arguing here is that that's the fundamentally wrong question to ask. That when we ask that question, what we're assuming is not only this kind of unity of the people that act, that there is some sort of agent that can ask this question in some way, but we're also assuming that there's a singular answer to this, right? That we can sit there and we can decide that in all terrains and all spaces for all people, um, that there's a right thing to do, right? Um, and what this assumes is the very same thing that I was just talking about with Occupy. It assumes this sort of conceptual enemy, right? The 1%, the state, the police, so on, so on, so on, right? And it assumes this kind of unitary force and kind of frontal confrontation in this sort of completely blank conceptual space. Right? That we're all engaging in this way with this thing. Right? And what it tends to do is reduce things down to a rhetorical struggle. Right? We're in this frontal confrontation where we can just complain very loudly, or that's what we should be doing. That we should be engaging on the level of passion. Right? That we should be going out there because we're really, really passionate about like Palestinian independence, right? And like hitting the streets and like having demonstrations and spending our time doing that, even though um, very few of us understand, have any understanding of how the occupation operates in our city. What does that mean, right? This was one of the big questions behind um, doing counter-military resistance in like the mid 2000s. Was the impetus behind doing that was about understanding how did the war function where you were, right? Which the easiest answer always was bodies, right? They recruited bodies. Um, that ended up turning into the port occupation campaigns out on the West Coast, right? How do you stop the war? You stop people from getting there, right? You shut down the ports, you stop striker brigades from deploying, right? So on, so on, so on. But these kinds of micro engagements, right, um, are never what's thought about generally when the movement is thought about. These are thought about as kind of local initiatives. And what I'm arguing is that that's all that they're fundamentally is. That when we ask the question of what is to be done, what we're doing is we're creating the same assumptions that turn resistance into a kind of conceptual game, right? A game in which we're attempting to sort of register discontent, right? Potentially get someone to change some decision or something like that. And that is what myself and the people in the journal collective that I'm working with term activism, right? It's this sort of tendency to have an impetus to engage all the time, regardless of what's going on, regardless of what the conditions are, regardless of how you can impact things, where your energy should be going, what your capacity is, right? All of us have been through this, right? All of us have gone, you know, completely headlong into this for periods of time. All of us have burned ourselves out, sitting there and accomplishing very, very little. 
right? We always wonder why. And the reason why we accomplish very little can be seen with the anti-war movement itself, right? So the anti-war movement was another one of these moments in time where it seemed like everything was happening, right? Like 400,000 people in the streets on a monthly basis all over the place, like millions of people in the streets on certain days all over the country, right? What did they do? They like went, they got their permits, they marched around in a big square, they got on their buses and they went home. The irony of this entire situation is that with a little bit of strategic analysis, all anyone would have had to do was just sit down and it would have locked down Capitol Hill, right? Um, it would have just taken that little move out of the conceptual into the material. And very, very clearly, it would have impacted the functioning of the war, right? But people chose not to do that. That what was important was registering discontent, changing public opinion, right? Raising consciousness, all of these very nebulous goals, which were taken as ends in themselves. So to get beyond the question of what is to be done requires us to fundamentally reconceive of what it is that we're doing, right? And to reconceive that on sort of a series of levels, um, starting with an understanding of what gets lost within the perspective of your traditional sort of narrative of activism and social movements within the United States. <clears throat> so the first thing that gets lost in this narrative is sort of the particularity of the enemy, right? So we have this idea of say the 1%, right? This concept of like wealthy people. And there's this idea that, you know, if you march on Jamie Dimon's house, which is something that happened during Occupy, like people marched on Jamie Dimon's house. And like, it scared him enough to move to his second mansion in Connecticut, right? And he like left the city and he helicoptered himself into work every day. And like, you know, he was scared of like the rabble mass mob that was hanging out a couple blocks from his house. and like. But it didn't impact him on any sort of fundamental level. Because at the end of the day, Jamie Dimon as a person isn't what can be considered the enemy, except on a very conceptual level, right? How does someone like Jamie Dimon function? Well, Jamie Dimon's the head of a bank. How does that bank make money? That bank makes money due to the relevance of the monetary system, right? The function of land enclosure, private property, real estate, things that are fundamentally upheld by a structure and logistics of policing itself, right? Without the cops, preventing strikes from happening, there can be no economic investment, right? Without the police stopping homeless people from going into abandoned homes, there's no such thing as a real estate market, right? Without people like taking over land and deciding that they're going to create things in different ways, without the police stopping them, there's no such thing as resource scarcity. There's no such thing as commodification. There's no such thing as the necessity of wage labor, the real estate market, so on, so on, so on, right? The structure of money itself collapses. And so when we're thinking about something like the enemy, whatever we decide is the enemy. We tend to think about these things in these highly conceptualized ways, right? So let's take another example being hydraulic fracture, okay? Um, given that the moratorium is on here, talk about this in you know, reference to Pennsylvania. Um, but there's always this question, there's always this like idea that the enemy is the gas company, right? And the gas companies are everywhere and they're like getting all these leases signed and so and so and so on. Um, and so people will like, hold demonstrations at the headquarters of gas companies as if they give a shit, right? Or they'll like go to Department of Environmental Conservation meetings as if they give a shit. Um, but every once in a while you get these stories about people in a small town like Dimmick, Pennsylvania, it was happening in Dimmick, Pennsylvania, where someone was going around slashing the tires on the buses that got people to work, right? Or it was in uh, southwestern Pennsylvania, someone was shooting up gas wells with shotguns. And what that forced the gas company to have to do was roll their executives into town in armored convoys with Blackwater security guarding them. Just to be able to give a little talk to the town about how all of a sudden they were gonna get everyone water buffaloes because all the water had been poisoned, right? But it was these very immediate actions against a very immediate understanding of the enemy that fundamentally changed that scenario. Not this kind of attempt to complain about gas companies, right? In that same town, in Dimmick, Pennsylvania, right, in the town where the, the bus tires got slashed, um, like two weeks before that, they'd had this massive demonstration, because I don't know if people know about Dimmick, but it's like, you can't drink any water in Dimmick, Pennsylvania. It's like horrendously poisoned. The water is black when it comes out of, out of people's taps, and you can light the water on fire, right? And so all these people from Dimmick came out, they were having a, an environmental conservation hearing in Dimmick, and all these people came out, like 200 people, all these people from Pittsburgh came up, there were people from Philadelphia there, like, Dimmick's a very, very small town. So there were like, 
people flooding all the streets in, in the middle of the town. And people that lived in the town were holding up vials of water that were on fire, right? And that didn't do anything, literally nothing, because the Department of Environmental Conservation decided not to care, right? That in approaching these kind of symbolic enemies, right, these sort of displaced, conceptualized enemies, what we fail to do is understand how the enemy functions, right? So you think about something like a gas company, or you think about something like a police department, right? They're not unitary entities, but they function. People do things. They exist in some way, right? Um, they have logistical hubs. They have capacities, right? One of the things that happened during G20 in Pittsburgh was we exceeded the capacity of the logistics of the police in that city for that one day from functioning at the point where they ran out of gasoline. Right? And I don't know how many, how many people here were on the police movement's Twitter that day. It was about 9 o'clock PM. The message went out that the cops ran out of gas. And it had gone out over the police scanner. So for people that know how crowd control functions and how crowd control preparation functions, they got a gas requisition for what they considered to be the worst possible scenario for three days. And they ran out of it in eight hours. Right? And the reason they did that wasn't because there were like a thousand anarchists in the streets. The reason that happened was because there were a thousand anarchists in the streets running all over the place, barricading off random side streets, preventing themselves from getting contained, breaking up into small groups, forcing the police to have to chase them, preventing themselves from being able to be contained, forcing the cops to have to spread the zone of containment out, spread the zone of containment out, try and cover more space. When they try and cover more space, they have to disperse their numbers. When they have to disperse their numbers, they have to move around a lot more. And in moving around, they ran out of gas. Right? It was something that was, I would say for most of us, somewhat unconscious. It was just mobility was a more rational strategy than marching around in one giant group. Right? And I think that that's about where the analysis was, is that like, we're a lot more effective if we move around. But the reality is, is that doing that fundamentally impacted the police, like their ability to logistically function. Right? We were talking about ISIS a little while ago here. Um, and one of the fascinating things about ISIS is what they do is they're always, they're very adept at picking out the weak point of their enemy, the point of greatest strategic intervention, <coughs> the point where they can get the greatest resources with the least amount of effort, and the point where they can engage with the greatest amount of strategic advantage. And they do this by mobility. They move around. Now, of course, that will be their downfall, <coughs> right? They eventually want to become the state, which means that they have to hold space they have to sit there, they have to police that space, right? They have to make sure that their enemies can't have that space, right? And with 5,000 guys, you can't really do that in an area the size of Indiana, right? That the very thing that makes them successful would be the very thing that causes their failure, right? With us, we don't have that problem as anarchists. We do not have that problem of having to control space, right? And so when we're engaging with an enemy, we can engage in these very direct, very pointed ways, rather than these very conceptual ways and these very generalized, with these very generalized understandings of who the enemy is, right? You can see this again with uh, police brutality. Um, in Cleveland, okay, a year and a half ago, um, a car was driving by the Injustice Center, right, which is the kind of main police station downtown, also where the county jail is, also where the state prison is, right? And the car backfired. And the cops thought that the car had fired a shot at the building. And so like 50 cop cars chased this car down. Six miles later, when they're in East Cleveland, the car crashes. The cops fire 137 shots into the car, including 10 shots fired by a cop standing on the hood of the car, firing into the already dead bodies of the people inside. Okay? Just like, and cops shoot people in Cleveland all the time. I was telling people in Buffalo on Thursday before I left, the cops had shot someone on Wednesday night, right? On West 25th Street in a gentrifying area uh, because there had been a couple shootings in the neighborhood that night, right? And as neighborhoods gentrify, those of us that live in cities know that street gangs that exist in areas tend to get their territories pushed together and violence increases, right? So it's very much going on in this part of the city. Um, two shootings that happened that night. So the cops roll up on the housing projects and they find two 20-something black males standing outside 
one of which takes off running and magically, apparently, points a gun behind his back like this. And it's the cop shot him in the back, right in front of the hospital. So the nurses ran out, grabbed him, put him on a stretcher, ran him inside, right? That was so, uh, that was so not a news story, because it happens so frequently, that the most coverage I found on it was three paragraphs long, right? But what tends to happen when things like this go down? Well, people get together and they sometimes march on the police station downtown and they get really, really mad and they hold a bunch of signs and, you know, cops in Cleveland are very good at de-escalating situations, right? So they'll stand there. And, you know, people will even throw stuff at them and they won't do anything because everyone knows if the cops were to hit somebody, the whole east side of the city specifically would go up in flames, right? Um, but they're really good at de-escalating situations. And then people leave the street and everything goes back to the way it was, right? What doesn't happen generally, except out of very, uh, outside of very specific areas, is people don't intervene to keep the police out of their neighborhoods when they function there. Right? So you take a neighborhood like mine, uh, which is a largely Puerto Rican neighborhood. Every time the cops show up in the neighborhood, what do people do? They like start heading inside, right? Like they start talking real quietly, even if they're not talking about anything sketchy. Um, that it is a process of creating a sense of opacity in the neighborhood. But what hasn't happened is the sense of trying to understand what they do, when they do it, when their pat like what their patterns are, who they are, when they function there, and so on. Right? There's not this localized, material understanding of policing in an area. There's just this concept of the police in general, right? Uh, like one of the biggest qualms I have with Christian Williams, and I love Christian Williams' work, um, like 95 percent of like 95 percent of the time. One of the qualms I have is that he fuses two terms together constantly, which is the terms police and the term policing, right? And these are fundamentally different things. Uh, police are this kind of conceptual entity, right? In Cleveland, there's something like 3,200 of them. Policing is the operation of the police, the construction of the police force as material entity, the things that they do. So on that level, you can say, do something like, get your city's annual report. Look at the number of police they have, look at the number of precincts they have, look at the number of administrative staff are counted within that number of total police. Subtract the administrative staff because they're not on the streets. Divide the remaining number by the number of precincts that exist, and then multiply that by three because they run on three shifts, and that's the amount of cops you have on the street at any given time, right? Which you will probably unsurprisingly find is a very, very, very small number, right? So Pittsburgh had 917 cops for the entire city of Pittsburgh, okay? Cleveland, which has the same population, has 3,200. 3,200 police, right? Of that, though, there might be 50 in a precinct at any given time, right? So their capacity is not very high. The amount of space that they cover is not very much, right? Even if you were to take the amount of space that they're physically in and add their eyesight to that, right? That space isn't very much, right? So the way that they function on this very particular material level happens through radio communication, right? They're able to support each other. They move around very well, right? Cars, they use vehicles. Um, so they can move around space a lot more quickly than they used to, right? They have cameras, right? Police cameras, but also cameras and things like convenience stores, which increase their visibility very dramatically, right? But none of that means anything to the degree that there's actual material resistance in an area. One of the things that we learned about Syria uh, when we were doing the research on Syria is that as a state entity moves through space, when they face resistance, they have to concentrate numbers to move through that space, right? We see this all the time. Uh, cops in Pittsburgh, when there's a traffic stop, right? The entire team that, control, that patrols an area will converge on one traffic stop, right? So there'll be one car pulled over, five police cars, and a van with a dog at a traffic stop, right? That means the whole rest of the area is just wide open, right? So even very minor discretions, like running a red light, causes these dramatic crises within their ability to cover space, right? As they concentrate numbers, 
they're not allowed, they're not able to project those numbers at the same time, right? Projection takes things like gasoline, right? It takes material resources, it takes energy. Any of us that have been at a summit demonstration when it's hot outside, right? Like July or August or anywhere in the South ever, right? You will always see cops behind the line taking their helmets off, just pouring sweat, right? Wearing 70 pounds of riot gear, running through a really hot sun, probably sucks really bad, right? But they wear down over time, right? They get tired, they're people too, right? To mirror the liberals, right? <laughs> but kind of these weird Frankenstein monsters of people that are also supposed to represent the totality of the state. Um, but they wear down, right? You take um, the blockade that happened in, I forget where, right after the Earth First Rondi that happened in Pennsylvania, right? The one where people actually moved around a lot, where like stuff would get dragged in the road and people would move, and the stuff would get dragged in the road and people would move, right? That was much more difficult to contain than if everyone was just sitting there. Right? All of a sudden they have to remove barricades, they have to move down the road, they have to remove another one, they have to move down the road. Then they have to worry about where people are. Right? Uh, 2009 Spring IMF, right? they couldn't move delegates because they didn't know where 200 anarchists were. They just lost them through an interesting mix of, of disinformation and moving numbers around. They just lost people and so they couldn't move anybody. Right? That we tend to think of the enemy generally as remarkably powerful. Right? There's always this narrative that we can't fight them or something like that, right? But that's very much never the case. When you look at Egypt, let's go back to Egypt. In Egypt, for 32 years, people were just assumed they couldn't fight the state. And then they did, and it crumbled almost immediately, right? Very, very quickly. Same thing happened <coughs> in Libya. Same thing happened in Syria, even though the Syrian state's holding on. But the state as an entity that actually controls space crumbled in most parts of the country pretty quickly, right? So when we're thinking about the enemy, we have to think about the enemy on a very material and logistical and immediate level, right? Otherwise, the understanding of how we engage stays within these very conceptual limitations of these very conceptual engagements that happen in these very rhetorical levels, right? The second thing that happens within the traditional sort of activist narrative is this sort of generalizing of the terrain, right? This understanding that the terrain of engagement is the nation, right? Or the city or something like that, right? That we worry about city council people, right? Which can be used very strategically, right? But um, when we start thinking about the city itself as an entity, we're engaging in this sort of operational fiction, right? I think this became very clear when I was living in Pittsburgh. So if anyone knows anything about the neighborhoods in Pittsburgh, there's like 96 neighborhoods in Pittsburgh. Um, about half of them are on the tops of hills. Like literally on the tops of hills. And there's like nothing going down the hill. It's like these little city lits all over the place, right? And they're entirely walled off from one another. There's people who like have never left their neighborhood ever who live in Pittsburgh, right? Um, but you go into the middle of the city and you're living in Lawrenceville. It's a very different place than literally right across the street from my house, which was Bloomfield, which had very different dynamics in it, which is very different than Garfield, right? You're in my neighborhood right now. I live in a Puerto Rican part of my neighborhood, which is like families who've lived there for 20 years, who all know each other, right? You go three blocks from my house, it's $180,000 condos. Very different terrain of engagement all of a sudden, right? And so when we're thinking about what we're doing, this idea that we're like, holding space in a park to make some sort of rhetorical statement about free speech or something like that in order to like stick it to the 1% or something, um, fails to recognize where we're actually engaging. So if you look at where a lot of Occupy parks were, um, they were in these remarkably vulnerable spots, right? You look at even at Oscar Grant Park in Oakland, right? Um, it was right by City Hall. It was right by the Central Police Station. It was in the middle of an area of Oakland that, unless you're going to work or coming from work, no one ever really goes to, right? It was in the middle of downtown. Um, it was an area that people had to truck logistical support into, right? The debate that happened around Occupy Pittsburgh was um, a lot of the like liberals and socialists wanted to take over a park downtown, which ended up working out on a certain level because it was private property and 
created all these legal problems as far as getting rid of the camp, but they wanted to camp downtown. What that meant though, was that every single day, people who lived in the East End, which was where our base of support was, had to cook food, put it in their cars, drive their cars all the way down to downtown, maybe find a parking spot, because I don't know if you've ever tried to park in downtown Pittsburgh, it's not specifically easy, right? Find a parking spot, walk down to the camp, drop the food off, probably end up getting into an argument with someone and then leave it, right? And that was like a two hour adventure to make that happen, usually during rush hour, either in the morning or in the evening, right? The anarchists were arguing to take over a park called Friendship Park, like in the middle of the East End, where literally 90% of our supporters lived within walking distance, right? People could show up if there was a threat to the park, right? We could get supplies very, very easily, if that was even the goal to hold the park. Right? And that was always this kind of open question with us. So in choosing these parks, people chose these areas that were sort of conceptually important. Right? Parks right in front of city halls. Um, in DC, people always have demonstrations on the National Mall. Right? For people that were around IMF, like we never had demonstrations by the National Mall because the National Mall is a police state. Right? Um, there's like 32 police departments with jurisdiction in that area of DC including Capitol Hill Police and, and DC Metro. Um, so in choosing areas of engagement, in choosing places of engagement, it becomes highly important to think about where do we have our advantages, right? So in thinking about this, that means getting beyond um, the primary problem that we tend to run into in social movements, and that's this privileging of passion over strategy, right? We sit there often and we get really, really passionate about a thing. Right, whatever that thing happens to be. You know, I find this with a lot of my friends who are really into animal rights. You know, they're like, I want to start an animal rights group. And I'm like, that's great. What are you going to do that's different than like Veg Fund or like PETA that's actually going to mean something? Because if you're not willing to like take out an animal research lab, you're pretty much being just PETA, right? And PETA does what you want to do better than you will, right? They get people to be vegan, right? They're really, really good at that. They show really messy videos and they get people to be vegan, right? But if the point is to start an animal rights group in an area, but you haven't thought about how you're going to intervene yet, right, or where, or what animal research even looks like in your area or something like that, um, it's a move that's being driven by passion primarily, right? Um, I think a lot of us <clears throat> have gotten beyond the like passion-driven game, largely out of getting beaten down so bad so many times that like, Passion ceased to be that important, but it came out of disillusionment, right? Disillusionment that still was engaging, but disillusionment nonetheless. And that's an important thing. I mean, when Aragorn was in Cleveland at the book fair, one of the things he was talking a lot about was how um, anarchists from that era of the early to mid to late 2000s, right? People who were involved from like 2003 to 2010 um, went through so much shit those of us that were very, very involved, went through so much shit that it changed us in these very profound ways, right? Um, that we became hardened in, in a lot of ways to things like repression, things like caring about like the emotions of people that we don't trust, right? Which was this thing that kept us safe for a very long time, right? Um, and that's led to a mentality of engagement which is based in the idea of what does it take to win? And that's a very different level of engagement that you saw within something like Occupy. And that's a very different level of engagement than you saw with something like the anti-war movement, right? Was there, there was this idea of what does it take to change the narrative, right? How do we convince people that we're right, right? We saw with the anti-war movement how that failed really badly. We did win that fight. Right? We won the rhetorical struggle. Right? Most people were against the war by the time it started. Um, and that meant nothing. Literally nothing. It's not like soldiers started disobeying orders and you know, leaving base and deserting and things like that. It added up to very little. It added up to you know, United for Peace and Justice still existing, which, big deal. Right? Um, so <clears throat> to move beyond these assumptions of symbolic engagement requires sort of reframing what we're doing on a series of different levels, right? That firstly, we have to recognize that all engagement, all action that we take 
doesn't matter whether we're like walking down the street or like, you know, organizing in clandestine radical movements or something like that. Everything that we're doing is fundamentally material, right? We're engaging somewhere at some time in some way within some dynamic of actions that's occurring. Um, that for as much as we would like to kind of discuss this idea of changing the narrative or consciousness raising, um, we never kind of get to a point um, in which these kind of become anything other than tactics, fundamentally, right? So there's this idea within social movements that we have to build mass movements, right? That that's a fundamental imperative. Right, that we have to change people's minds and so on. But that's not always necessarily the most strategically conducive thing to do. Necessarily, right? That means that we have to reframe when we're thinking about things like having demonstrations, right? Or when we're thinking about things like movie showings, when we're thinking about things like lecture series, things like this, right? That we have to start thinking about them on the level of what is our objective and how is this getting us there? Right? Rather than on the level of it being a necessary imperative. That this is the fundamental fallacy of something like platformism. Right? The idea that we have to convince people that there is a singular right way of living. That we can all fight for through a certain plan. Right? Not only is the idea that agreement means anything mythological. Right? We all understand things in very fundamentally different ways. It's kind of the fallacy of consensus. Right? When you have a consensus agreement, you're all agreeing to fundamentally different things necessarily, even though you might articulate them in the same ways. Um, but what it also means is that, and this is something coming out of George Sorel, who I don't know if people have read George Sorel, but they should, uh, 19th century French syndicalist, right? Um, he's talking about the idea of the general strike. And he's like, look, the general strike is a myth, right? It's a mythology. It's not just a mythology in the sense that everybody understands that in a different way, but it's a mythology in the sense that it's a myth to hold on to, right? That's something that in itself can tactically motivate action, but in itself is something that in the way that individually we may conceive of it, isn't going to occur, right? We can say the same thing about the idea of the movement, right? The movement doesn't exist in a singular way, right? There's been all of these things. I mean, like one of the reasons that this talk got put together, one of the reasons that uh, the collective around insurgencies is writing our whole introduction to the journal about this and so on is critiques of activism have tended to center around things like, man, activists are annoying or meetings really suck, <laughs> right? They tend to like focus on these like very immediate negative experiences that people have. Um, and it's the same thing with movements, right? Like there's this narrative of like, well, movements are ineffective, right? Without ever this sort of attempt to grapple with what does that even mean? What do we mean when we talk about the movement, right? And fundamentally, we talk about the movement, we're talking about a fiction. A potentially important, effective fiction, but a fiction nonetheless, right? And we can see in the Arab Awakening what the fiction of the movement can do, right? There were these weird moments uh, where Egyptian anarchists would be fighting alongside people in the Muslim Brotherhood on the front line against the police in Cairo. And those differences didn't matter in a conceptual way. What mattered was the immediacy of the engagement, right? One of the other projects that the collective that's doing insurgencies will be working on probably in the fall is a reader's guide to Clausewitz's On War for Anarchists. And the fundamental point behind that is that we have to create a separation in the way that we think about what we're doing, right? That there's two fundamental questions that tend to be involved. The first one is, the question of why individually at this moment in time I feel motivated to engage, right? There is no non-engagement, right? There's always this discussion that like, you know, just, and, and, and people, friends of mine that are like socially isolated by choice are like sick of being surrounded by mediocrity, right? Are like, oh man, screw it, I'm just not engaging, right? But there is no such thing as non-engagement. Like, everything that we do every choice that we make to the degree that we approach our existences as relevant shapes history, right? Everything we do is an intervention in history. There's no opting out, right? So the question of how we engage, right? Like this idea of like what we're doing and the question of why we're doing it are fundamentally separate questions. The question of why we're doing it 
is a sort of particularized question of how we individually make sense of our existence, right? Where we are, when we are, you know, like you're, we're in Rochester right now, Rust Belt City, you know, a city that's like dealing with a lot of deindustrialization, a lot of economic abandonment, right? Um, you know, I live in Cleveland, right? Just like the poster child for economic abandonment. That's not Detroit, right? Like, and literally, it's like not Detroit, and that, that's its like claim to fame that LeBron James. Um, and now the often see, unfortunately. Um, but so that motivates a certain kind of resistance from the people that grow up there, right? The discussion in the mid 2000s in Cleveland was like, shit, we have nothing to lose, right? Might as well just go all out. We have nothing to lose, like literally nothing to lose. We have no future, none of us. Whether we have an education or not, just none. Our neighborhoods were going abandoned. The police were killing people left and right. Like people were killing people left and right. There's the whole city had turned into a war zone. There was just no, no hope, right? And no future. And so things like going to Toledo to like riot in a neighborhood for three days because neo-Nazis were there made a ton of sense, right? Because if you could find that spark, that was our only hope, right? But that was a mentality that was bred in a certain period of time, right? And that wasn't what ended up, like that was a separate question than um, in the moment what we were doing like what we were doing on the level of engagement, right? What the material dynamics of our actions were necessarily, right? So in other words, there's a separation between politics in this conceptual way and engagement in this kind of material level, right? They always exist at a separation. I mean, we can think about this on a more kind of like base platonic philosophical level, right? And I'm a philosophy professor, so I'm gonna use like basic philosophy professor example, okay? I call that thing a table. Okay, I have a very specific understanding of what I mean when I call something a table. That has to do with like, however my experiences of things that I call tables happen to be, right? But that object is a very different object than any other object. And is a different thing than what it was five seconds ago, right? It's degrading, it's changing, it has a different relationship with the objects on top of it, so and so and so on. Right, Marx, Capital, Volume One, like the first chapter of Capital, Volume One, is about this question. You know, the commodity form is this sort of conceptual understanding of an object that's somehow the same as other objects. But we all know that those objects have kind of particularized use values, right? Particularized existences, ways that they are that are fundamentally different than other chairs or other tables or other like energy drinks or other cigarettes or something like that, right? And what I'm saying here is that we have to respect the same difference when we're conceiving of how and what we're engaging around, right? Then one level, we have these very base conceptual understandings, right? Capitalism sucks. The police are assholes, right? Like these are things that, you know, are very generally pretty basic amongst a crowd of radicals, right? But at the same time, what that means, where we are, what our, experience of, what our experiences of that are, are very, very, very profoundly different, right? that we have to come to terms with, on a certain level, the limitations of the way that we can project our actions, right? That we are these people, right? These individual people. I think uh, radicals often forget this, right? That there's a sense that we're like superheroes or something, or like that we're these kind of political subjects or something like that. Really, at the end of the day, we're like people who live on streets with neighbors and stuff, right? Most of us go to crappy jobs that we hate and like eat food and like, you know, have weird things like really liking macaroni and cheese or something like that. And like, you know, like to watch a daily show when we want to unwind, just like we're people, right? And as people, we have these limitations in the things that we can do individually, right? That the question of what we're doing really becomes this question of how are we engaging in the very specific dynamic that we find ourselves in? The question of why we've made that choice, why we've chosen this side, is a different, much more conceptual question, right? And those questions have to be separated from one another. Um, this is one of the discussions that's going on around the RNC in Cleveland right now, which is this idea that like, yeah, Republicans suck. But really at the end of the day, because a bunch of Republicans are being downtown doesn't really matter. What matters is the very specific things that are happening on our streets, right? The fact that since that announcement, the cops are already outside our bookstore, right? Since the idea that they've already given millions of dollars 
a lot of which came out of the emergency fund for the school district, to the host committee to fund the convention, right? That this is going to change the way the police function in our city. That this is going to change which roads get fixed, which street lights get replaced. This is going to change everything. And for us, that convention started like three weeks ago, right? And it's not going to end until some indeterminate moment in the far future, maybe, at which those three days that happen in the middle are like a stopping off point, a kind of waypoint, right? That the question isn't, fuck Republicans, right? The question is really that the cronyism of the city government, right? And the way that that manifests on our streets is going to fundamentally impact the way that we live, right? It's a much more material question. And that breeds a much different form of engagement, right? A form of engagement that's very necessarily has to be grounded in the particularities of the things happening, right? With an understanding of that to the degree that we can gain one, right? That the question here isn't um, conceptual enemies and like reading Naomi Klein and understanding global capitalism or something like that, right? And all that's cool and Naomi Klein's great and all that, but what this fundamentally means is that we have to understand how something like globalization means something on our streets, right? So Rochester, right, is the city, what, what was the big industry in Rochester? Kodak. Kodak. Oh, Kodak. really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, fun. I'm sure there's a lot of... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Fun. Um, but, you know, it became cheaper to, like, produce digital cameras, and it became cheaper to do that in, in Korea, right? Or Japan, or... I mean, where are they producing now? Singapore, right? Places like that. Kodak totally dropped the ball on digital cameras. Well, they did, yeah. Yeah. But Kodak collapsed because of the digital camera, right? Mm -hmm. um, they collapsed because of their own stupidity, and I worked there when it happened. Sure, I yeah. I can tell you some horror stories. Yeah, I'm not surprising, right? But you got to think, that impacted your life in this very particular way. That impacted, like, you know, the guy that you work next to in a very different way. Right? The collapse of Kodak, the bad decisions of executives, the rise of the digital camera and cheap disposable electronics. Like, you know, these things that we can understand in these very conceptual ways mean very material things very obviously, right? Um, and that's the level of engagement necessarily, right? The level of engagement isn't on the level of globalization this conceptual, on this conceptual level. The level of engagement is on the level of, you know, Kodak collapsing because of bad decisions devastated the city devastated the city, right? Not just financially, but environmentally too, right? And that's a legacy that you all are living with. And that's the level of engagement. What does that mean here now, right? In this space, in our lives, right? Not on this grand conceptual level of economics, although that's a framework through which we can attempt to understand things. Um, <laughs> that secondly, the materiality of conflict, the materiality of the level in which we engage is this fundamentally particular thing. And that means that there's no way to answer the question of what is to be done without fundamentally eliminating the specificity of the dynamics of where we are, right? So this idea that we can have an answer to this question, right? Anyone that was around after Miami remembers the uh, direct action versus community organizing debate. Right, where some people were like, all we need to do is community organizing, that's anarchy. And other people were like, we need to fuck shit up, that's anarchy, right? And it was like this discussion about like this power struggle within the movement about like, what, how do we answer the question of what is to be done after this, right? Do we militarize? Do we like get better at fighting, right? Or do we disengage entirely, right? From that level of engagement and really both of those schools of thought had it fundamentally wrong. Not because the answers were incorrect or something, but because there is no answer. That every time we answer that question, we come to replicate the same kind of conceptual terrain of engagement, the same sort of conceptual unity that we see ourselves in, against the same kind of conceptual enemy that plagued Occupy, right? And that plagued the anti-war movement before that. That we have to get beyond the idea that there's an answer to that. That we even have to get beyond the idea that there's an answer to that where we are, right? That when we act, the conditions of action change. That's why we do it, right? There are effects to the things that we do. And when we act, those effects change the dynamic of the terrain that we're in. And that means we have to fundamentally recalculate 
all the time, right? That when we try and come up with our nerd strategies of engagement, what we're attempting to do is fight history, right? Not on the level of fighting the trajectory the history has taken, but on the level of literally fighting the idea that things happen, right? We're trying to entrench something in place, right? I mean, how many times have we all been in like protest movements where someone goes, okay, something wrong with the world. Okay, we've got to like have a rally and then a march, right? And then you go back to the next meeting and go, hey, what are we going to do? We're going to have a rally and a march, but this time we're going to issue a press release, right? And then you have a rally and a march, you issue a press release. And then you have a rally and a march, and then you issue a press release. And you do this over and over and over and over and over again. And maybe, maybe you hit the ceiling of that tactic, which is like passively sitting down in front of something and like getting arrested. And then people go to jail and then you gotta pour a bunch of money into jail support. And but at the end of the day, there's never this understanding of even challenging that mode of engagement at all, right? Pushing past the assumption that that's what we should be doing or something, right? Or even attempting to analyze what that does in a very particular way. It's again, it's always this attempt to like change this conceptual narrative, right? Which can be a strategy but tends to become a default in the things that we do. So finally, what this means in essence is that we have to move beyond what we have conceived of as activism. Right? We have to move into a fundamentally different mode of engagement, one which is fundamentally rooted in immediacy right, and strategy, one which you know, the Journal Collective calls insurgency. Right? Then we tend to think of insurgents as you know, what we see in Iraq or something like that. But all insurgency is, fundamentally at its core, you know, people who are really, people are really into Carl Schmitt, right? everyone should be really into Carl Schmitt. Um, but fundamentally at its core, all insurgency is, is a hostility towards the state. Right? It's an immediate material engagement. Right? It's a question of understanding who the enemy is here and now in a very material way, right? And that means fundamentally conceiving of what we're doing, not on the level of thinking about what we're passionate about doing, but on the level of thinking about what's the most effective thing to do. And that may mean doing things that on the level of passion or conceptual politics, we wouldn't otherwise do, like own a bookstore or talk to a city council person, <laughs> or work with communist groups, or something like that. But it ceases to be this question of inclusiveness, right? And starts to become a question of what are we going to be able to get the most out of strategically, right? That becomes a question of how we set our objectives. What do we want to get out of something that we can do, right? What are our capacities to do something? Where are we doing something? When are we doing it? What are the dynamics of doing it there and then? And it's only at that point that we can fundamentally move beyond the question of what is to be done. And it's only at that point that we can fundamentally move beyond the question of activism. And so, anyone has questions? Can take questions. I'm sure we're all gonna hang out so we can like shoot shit later. Um, yeah, thank you for having me.